Okay. This is chapter five. And in chapter five, we're going to talk about financial statements and the analysis of finan financial statements. And this is something that you can um, utilize in, in, the, in the simulation we're doing in class as well. Because it has, you know, when you finish the round, it says, if you look in the finance page, it'll say last year's financial statements. And the next column will say next year's or pro forma financial statements. And this is how it ties to that. All right. So, in the also in the simulation, when you when you're in the practice rounds and you get done with the practice round, the overview page comes up, and that's basically a financial ratio analysis, and you earn points based on the improvement of your financial ratios, a lot like a financial manager would earn points on the improvement of his company's financial ratios, quarter over quarter or year over year, and it helps to quickly assess the firm's financial health and well-being and how they're moving forward. Sort of like your report card. So if you were last semester a C student and this semester a B student, then it's pretty much just look it over real quickly and know that things are getting better for you as a student. Or maybe you're taking easier classes. The, uh... Now, a big area is computing profitability, liquidity, uh, debt, and uh, activity asset activity, market value, but prof profitability is, I think, one of the key areas of the financial statement analysis, and it's something in the simulation you need to be particularly pay close attention to. And in year, year zero, you start out with a 40% profit margin. So when you move to the next year, when you're doing the first year of the, of the simulation, you don't want to set your profit margins below 40%. Because it's very disappointing to your investors. So investors are used to 40% profit margins. You know, sort of like you might be used to $10 per hour pay or $12 per hour pay at your job. How would you feel if you came in next year and said, now you're going to make $10 per hour? Would you be very upset? That's how your shareholders feel as the owners who, you know, the earnings per share um, and their profitability are tied to this. So if you disappoint them in the in the gross profits and if you ever watch the stock market any stock that comes out and if they have earnings announcements and they disappoint on revenues or uh, profit ability the stock tumbles and crashes because investors do not like that so that's your first lesson as a as a financial manager don't disappoint on profit margins make sure that and how do you adjust or improve your profit margins very simple you reduce your costs and increase your prices or one or the other, or a combination of both. And sometimes it's a sad fact that you can't make the perfect car that meets or exceeds all your customer expectations because you have to sometimes reduce your, your variables to get the profit margin your in investors um, expect, even if it means building a car that you, don't, that you feel is not the best representation of what your company can do. All right. Now, and you compare financial information over time among other companies. So you know, once you finish a round in the simulation, you get a uh, industry page. And on the industry page, you get to see what all your competitors, their financial information, their sales, their ratios, their earnings per share, their points, you know, everything that pretty much how exactly how they built their car, their price margins, their profitability. So these financial statements are a great way of figuring out how you, how your competitors are um, are doing against you, and maybe get some ideas of what you can change to be more competitive. And in the car industry, it happens all the time. All this information is public. You can look at any car on the internet and find out all the specifics of uh, their features, miles per gallon, warranty. You can, all these companies are public, so you can look at their financial statements and know exactly how their capacity is, their financial ratios, their sales. All right. So ratio analysis um, is an easier way than trying to interpret just the raw numbers. So ratio analysis is a way um, to shortcut. You know, basically, think of it this way. Say you took a course last semester and it was chemistry. And I need to assess how well you did in chemistry. I could either sit there and look at all your tests and all your papers and all your homeworks and try to get an idea of how well you did, or I could just look at your grade for the course. So the grade is like a ratio 
that gives me a shortcut to understanding how well you did in the course. It doesn't tell me everything. It doesn't tell me how well you did on each test or if you did better on the homeworks in the paper than the test. It just gives me an overall score. And if I want to really know the details, I'll have to delve into the work. Uh, so financial ratios are a way to get an idea of how well you're doing. But if I want more details, I have to go into financial statements and, and research them. Okay. And it gives you a good way to... Um, measure or compare the company over time or to other firms. So if you want to, just like your report card from freshman year to senior, that's a timeline. And you could see how well, if you go into graduate school and the admissions, we look at that to see if you're on an upward scale where you started out poorly as a freshman but improved all the way to senior, or if it's the other way. You're an A student as a freshman, and then all the way down to senior year, your grades continually fall. So we want, we want a company on the uptrend just like we would want a student on the uptrend that's constantly improving and doing better. <coughs> and if we want to compare you to uh, companies together, it's a good way to shortcut and compare companies together. So we could see um, who's doing the best overall. Just like, if again, in graduate admissions, if I want to compare your, your um, transcripts against each other to get an idea of who's a better student. And a quick way, a very quick way for me to do that is just look at the the, the average, your average grade, your grade point average, right? So when you go for a job, they're going to size you up in two seconds. Just look at your grade point average and say, oh, below a three, we're not hiring you, right? Sorry to reveal that to everybody. No, everybody already knows. No, I'm just kidding. He's obviously has higher than three because you sit in the front row. Okay, so right again. The um, ratios are um, used primarily by financial managers uh, and other business managers, creditors, investors. So it's a shortcut for anybody who really wants to understand how the company is doing. Even if you're going to um, apply, if you are lucky enough to apply for a public company, look at their financial statements. You know, and there are many public companies that are small and they're on the internet. Um, um, or oh, their financial records are on the internet as a public company. That might be something you might want to look at, especially if you're applying for a financial or accounting position. Uh, you may want to ask some questions before, you know, maybe the company is, is near bankruptcy or has a solvency problem. You know, you may want to ask about that before you take the job because the company may be only open for a couple more months. Yeah. Or this may impress them. Wow, you actually looked at our financial statements and no one's ever done that before. Okay. Here's some Olympic tie-in because the Olympics are now. Who is this? Yes, uh, she was famous in the last Olympics because she got the silver medal. I think her name is Michaelia. And she, this is the smirk she made because she wasn't really happy that she got the silver and not the gold. So a lot of people uh, picked up that she wasn't so grateful. You know, she'd be happy you won the silver, but um, not her. You know, I could update that with some of the new athletes in the Sochi Olympics. But um, anyway, uh, it makes it un uh, accounting quick and easy to understand. And the uh, reason I put this picture up here is because, oh, that's her name. I even forgot that. She's not impressed. And um, that's the face I make when I have to do any accounting work. And um, that was actually me in my office, believe it or not. And uh, I have no books in the bookshelves because I was... I was already on the way out. When you know you're on the way out, you start bringing all your stuff home from the, your office, so that way it's easier to leave. Um, so uh, ratios make accounting quick and easy to understand. And if you ever had to do detailed accounting work, it's tedious. It's hard. So that's why I make that face. Um, so not impressed with accounting. But I do like the financial ratios because that can help me do my job very quickly if I'm in analyzing a company uh, or an investment or acquisition or just uh, looking for a stock to buy. Now, uh, these, are, these are the categories. Profitability, liquidity, debt, asset activity, and market value ratios. And we're going to go over all of those. And a lot of these ratios are in the Zoom simulation. So if you, this should help you uh, to understand how to interpret your results in the overview page a little bit more, or maybe help you to figure out how to improve your score, because the um, 
the scores of the individual practice, by and large, were uh, pretty low, which I would expect for the practice the first time you're using it. And the team scores are usually much higher. Uh, and what helps to get them higher is that as you're going through the class and learning about more about these uh, accounting and finance and financial ratios, you start to learn how to um, make changes in your company to get better scores. Okay. So we're gonna, these, the profitability ratio is going to measure the overall effectiveness of the firm's management. And the profitability ratios are some of the key ratios you really want to keep on top of in the simulation. And you always want to improve them round after round by hopefully two to six points if you can. So if you start out at 45 percentile, you want to go the next round, you're moving to the next round to maybe 50 percentile if you can. Um, so the first the top line profit uh, ratio is gross profit margin, where we have uh, gross profits divided by sales gives us a percentage. And it's telling us for every dollar of sales, how much of that is profit. So if your gross profit margin is 60%, for every dollar you have in sales, you get 60 cents in profits. And you could see why people would want to keep increasing that. And cost of Basically, you know, sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. So on the, uh, if you look on the income statement, it's these first two. And this is how I calculated that 40% in the simulation. I went to last year's financial ratios, uh, financial uh, statements rather, and I took gross profit divided by sales, and I figured out that the companies, we all start in a position of 40% on the gross profit. So that's your first hint from round one. If you have designed your cars and they have less than 40% profit, gross profit margins, which you see in the sales page, it gives you a profit margin right there. Gross profit margin on the sales page as you're designing your cars. Uh, you're going to disappoint investors and probably have a low points performance. Okay. Now, operating profit margin is the next level down. And we're going to look at operating income and sales. For you, for most companies, Marketing and advertising is a huge operating expense and is one reason why the operating profit margin is always lower than the gross profit margin. And then the operating profit margin, you take your, you have your sales minus your cost of goods sold and that's your gross. Now the operational looks at your SG&A expense, all your accountants, salespeople, finance people, human resources, all the office people are an expense. Uh, the cost of running the business and one of the biggest components for a lot of companies in your company is going to be advertising. For example, McDonald's has a very high gross profit margin, but a much lower operational profit margins because McDonald's advertises a good deal. You know, and we're familiar with uh, everybody in this classroom has seen a McDonald's commercial at least a thousand times in your in your lifetime so far. You know, figure, you know, um, that costs a lot of money to advertise like that, to have commercials consistently throughout the day, plus flyers and coupons and uh, all the other promotional stuff they do. And uh, generally, the rule of thumb is the, um, the crummier the product, the more you have to advertise. And that used to be a, a big hint in um, when I used to work. It's not so true today because things are different today, but... When I used to uh, work in the movie theater industry, uh, which I used to say I work in the entertainment industry, but I really just manage a movie theater, um, movies that would come out and be heavily advertised, we knew would be terrible. Because the worse the movie was, the harder they tried to advertise it to get people to go see it. And the better the movie was, the less advertising they did because word of mouth was big. And even today, um, how many people here will check? Um, they have something called Rotten Tomatoes. You go to uh, Flickster, and that's like my first clue, sort of like the Yelp of movies. Do you do that? Did you see the Lego movie yet? That has a very high percentile of red. I haven't seen it, but I probably won't see it, but unless it's on TV. Okay. So in to improve your operational profit margin, companies can lay off office people. And that usually happens during recessions. They can cut back on their advertising. Um, hopefully, they advertise more effectively. And that's sort of in the, in, the, in the Zoom simulation. You have the advertising grid. And you can throw money everywhere. But if you put more money in the, in the advertising venues that are more effective, you get more bang for your buck. You know? So 
companies try to uh, improve the efficiency of their operations to get this percentile up. And if you you may have increased you may increase your gross profit margin, but if you excessively advertise and remember in advertising in a simulation, there's a threshold where you get the you know every additional dollar you spend beyond this threshold, you get less of a return. So you get to a point where you're spending a lot of advertising money and no one is buying your car from it or very you know the first five hundred thousand maybe you get you know sell two thousand cars the next five hundred thousand you may only sell a thousand cars from that because the advertising at a certain point becomes less effective and I've noticed in the simulation in other classes that sometimes some teams over and uh, they over invest in advertisements and they don't build enough cars so they great they develop this terrific demand, say uh, a demand of 7,000, 8,000 vehicles, but they only built 4,000 vehicles. So they spent all this money advertising and they increased the demand, but they didn't get to fulfill it. So these are just, you know, manager people problems. Okay. And then the net profit margin is the very end, and this is uh, closer to what the actual shareholders are going to get in profits and what comes out of this would be taxes is the main um, the main thing that gets the separates operational from the net income so one way to improve your net income is definitely to be able to improve the way that um, you manage your taxes and also uh, interest expense. So these are two, in the simulation, you can't really manage your taxes. I mean, you, everybody pays the same amount. But you can reduce your interest. So in the beginning, you may be borrowing money, which is a good thing to get additional funds in the beginning to make your operational investments and buy new factories. But it's going to increase your interest expense. as you. The more debt you take on, the more interest expense you get. So as the simulation moves forward, you can actually start paying down the debt and reducing your interest, which will improve your net income percentage. But if you don't want to borrow debt, you can issue stock. But there's a drawback to both. If you borrow too much debt, you can pay more and more interest. If you issue stock to help pay for your company for the first couple of rounds, you probably should be borrowing um, additional funds to help grow your company's uh, assets and operational investments. Investing in the company in the first three rounds really pays off in the last three rounds. The, um, but you're going to have the cost of either interest expense or you, you expand, you buy too much, sell too much stock quickly, you expand the amount of outstanding shares, and that quickly lowers all your per share value uh, variables like earnings per share, revenues per share. Uh, so it's, it's a consequence. So let's move into um, return on assets. And this is um, ROA, some, as it's commonly known. This is on the Zoom simulation as well. And you're looking at net income in relationship to your total assets. So let's think about this for a minute. Your net income and assets. So what we're trying to measure is how, what's the, you know, a percentile that represents the income that your assets generate. So one way to, to make this more effective is to get more more assets get assets to generate more sales and profits you know for this is one reason you don't buy additional production plants when you don't need them so if you go and buy a production plant but you don't need any of the capacity you're increasing your asset base but you're not increasing your net income so you're going to have a lower percentile of return you know it's sort of the one example I might use is you open up, you can you can open up a a red mango and buy all those expensive uh, surf, uh, soft serve frozen yogurt machines. It's a lot of money invested to getting all like they have five or six of them in that store, so you have all those different flavors. Or you could just open up a um, an ice cream shop that just has a freezer and buckets of ice cream, sort of like a Haagen Dazs where they just have the or Baskin Robbins, where they just have the buckets in the freezer and you just scoop it out. Now, it could be the difference between needing $200,000 worth of assets to open up a red mango or $10,000 worth of assets to open up just a regular ice cream shop. If they're both, say they both have the same, the same amount of net income, 
the one with the smaller the smaller amount of assets are going to have a bigger return on those assets, right? So it's all about the return on the investment. If uh, if you were a pizza store and you needed to buy a delivery car, would you spend you know would you buy a Mercedes for eighty thousand to be a delivery car, or would you buy um, something like a Kia Soul for fourteen thousand? You have to sell and, and deliver a lot of pizzas to pay for that Mercedes. You're just not going to get a return on the asset. And, you know, these, de um, these delivery cars really get beat up and lose a lot of depreciation quickly. That's why if anybody ever here, anybody here ever deliver pizza as a part-time job? There's no shame in it. Okay. Did you, they made you use your own car, right? And that's because that's how they save money. Because now if you use your car, we don't have to buy an asset. And we get all the return, but we don't have to show that we have that asset on the books. And then you have to deal with the depreciation of the car, which sort of like for every $1,000 you make delivering pizza, you have to put another 100 or $200 back in your car in form of gas and repairs and oil changes. Um, how are the tips in that line of work? Okay. What was your biggest tip? 20 yeah. Okay, moving on. If uh if we look at uh in the on the income statement and uh balance sheet, it's you get your net income divided by your total assets. Pretty simple, and you get a percentage. And so in the zoom simulation you wanna try to increase this percentage, but you may not always be able to increase it because there could be some rounds where you have to buy a lot of operational investments in form of, uh, that gives you cost reductions or new plants. And sometimes you, it's a building phase where you're building out your assets and you don't have the net income yet. Just sort of like if you were, say, um, a, a restaurant and you were going to franchise and open up 10 new locations. That first year would be pretty expensive in your assets, building out those 10 locations. But then every year after that, if the restaurants are successful, you're going to be able to make more income and increase, improve upon that. All right. All right. So return on equity. Here we're looking at um, un understanding the equity portion of this. And equity is the amount of money you own in the business. So equity is really, um, if you look at the assets equal liabilities and equity, so the liabilities are money you owe to other, but other people, and equity is the money that you brought to the business or your piece of what you really own in the business. So a lot of times they like to look at the amount of your equity you bring to the business compared to net income. And one way to sort of think about this is, we'll talk about that ice cream shop again. If, if you bring um, $100,000 cash and you start, you pay for 100% of your business, you don't borrow any money, you bring up the $100,000 out of your bank account and buy that business, and you make $25,000 that year in net income, you have a return equity of 25%. Let's do it a different way. We're going to borrow $75,000 from the bank in liabilities, and we're going to only bring $25,000 of our money into buying the business. Now, that $25,000 in net income divided by $25,000 of equity, the money you brought into the business, you get 100% return on your money. So you invested $25,000, and you're getting a $25,000 return, 100% return. So sometimes having a large equity base in your company um, will lower your return on equity. But that's not always bad. That's not a bad scenario if the reason your return on equity is decreasing is because your profits, um, is because you're paying off more of your liabilities. So if you pay off more of your liabilities and you increase your equity base, you may see a, a, a decline in return on equity. That's not such a bad thing though. What would be worse is that the decline in equity is coming from the decrease in net income. So as the analyst, you want to look at this decline in retain on, on uh, re 
uh, return equity and see is this return equity declining because our net profits are smaller or because our common equity is increasing. If the common equity is increasing, that's nothing to worry about. If the net income is decreasing, then that's something to really complain about and, and question. You know, because as technically as a company pays off their liabilities and their debts, they should become more profitable because they're not paying interest uh, on money that was borrowed. You know. And again, net income divided by um, total equity. Okay, so let's move over to liquidity ratios. And here we're going to measure um, the firm's financial obligations. Uh, now, so liquidity is how liquid a firm is. And the more financial obligations and the smaller amount of current assets they have, the less liquid they are. So liquidity is, is sometimes a sign of risk. If you're a company that has a lot of debts, and it has a lot of liabilities and a small amount of um, ability to generate cash flow or a small amount of cash, then you're in jeopardy of going bankrupt or being insolvent by not having enough money. Sort of like in your life, if you're living in an apartment and you have a lease and a phone and all this stuff and you lose your job, there's a certain point where you may become bankrupt and you won't be able to afford your lifestyle anymore and have to live back home. And that's what basically could happen to companies. So we like to keep an eye on this liquidity ratio so we know that companies have more current assets coming in than their, their liabilities. So they have the ability to pay for and meet their financial obligations. So one measure could be current assets divided by current liabilities. And this can measure uh, a firm's you know, liquidity and sort of kind of get an idea of their safety net. So... For you as an individual, it might be as simple as thinking about how much cash do you have in the bank and what are this month's liabilities? You know, or, how, or you could think of um, how much money you're going to make. Say you don't have a lot of cash in the bank, but how much cash you're likely to make this month through employment or borrowing money versus your rent, your groceries, your cell phone bill, your internet bill, your Xbox Live bill. What other bills do you guys have? Netflix. Anybody pay for Netflix? <laughs> the um, So this gives you an idea how solvent a company could be because the last thing you want is for a company to go bankrupt because then you lose, if you're a stockholder, you're going to lose all your money. The invested stock goes to zero. And this again, current liabilities divided by current assets. and just gives us a multiple. And the, the larger this ratio, the better. So we want this ratio to be higher. The, um, so um, the current, let's move on from the current ratio. Uh, we have a couple other liquidity ratios. One is the asset test ratio. So for some companies, inventory is considered a current asset. And for a lot of companies, the inventory isn't as liquid. So if you're talking about, especially an, uh, a company where you're selling cars, cars is something that take a while to sell. You can't just you know, convert them to cash very easily if you need to have cash. So for some industries, we like to subtract out the inventory, and this is sometimes called the quick ratio also, more commonly known as the quick ratio. Here, they call it the asset test ratio for I don't know what reason, but most, most uh, financial people will say the quick test ratio. And we take out the inventory, and we get a better picture of how solvent the, um, a company is. Just sort of like you in your life, you have a lot of inventory in your life. You may have a lot of groceries. You may have a lot of books and DVDs or clothes. Who here feels like they have a lot of clothes? Okay. Now, what would happen if you try to convert those clothes back into cash? How easy would that be, and how much cash would you get? Very little, right? You can't just go on eBay and sell. Who wants to buy used clothes? The only thing you can do with old used clothes is donate them to somebody else. No, it's Or maybe to a thrift shop you could sell them, I guess. But... you. The, um, unless you've kept your receipts and you return them back to the stores you purchased them in. That's the only way to really convert them back to some sort of cash. And that even that is going to be limited because a lot of stores, if it's a certain period of time, what will the store do? Store credit. 
So they won't give you cash back or a refund, especially if you don't have a receipt. They'll give you store credit. You know what was really good though? I had a I had bought a pair of pants at Banana Republic in the outlet. And then I bought them thinking that I would fit into them, but I didn't fit into them because I didn't want to try them on in the outlet. So I had them I had them in the, in the house for a long time. And then like eight months later, I finally went to the Banana Republic to return them. I didn't have the receipt at that time. And uh, they gave me, I had to fill the form, but they reimbursed the full price of it, even though I bought it for like discount. I got it for like $30. They gave me like $56 back. But I try to tell them, like, listen, I got this at the, out, out, the outlet. It's, it, I didn't pay that much for it. She's like, oh, I can't help you, sir. This is what the register does. They, I tried to protest, but they didn't give me the cash right there. They mailed me a check, like, it took a couple of weeks. I was impressed. I was just hoping for store credit. I learned my lesson. Try your pants on at the store, right? Do you go clothes shopping? Do your mom still buy them for you? You do? Okay, good. I can't get my mom. I try to get my mom to buy me clothes, but she won't do it. Uh, I would love it if someone would buy my clothes because look what I'm wearing. This is, you know, I'm no good at it. Okay. The, um, the uh, asset test ratio, again, uh, we're looking at the current liabilities and current assets minus the inventory. Now, let's move on to the debt ratios. Everybody here in this room, you're all in debt. You're in debt. I'm in debt. If you have a credit card or student loan or car loan, you're in debt. It doesn't mean you're insolvent. It just means everybody in this room, we borrow money. And every company on earth, they borrow money. They may have, even Apple, they have plenty of, cash they still borrow money you know not everything is paid directly but we want to measure someone's solvency and, and their debt load if we're going to invest or look at you know ass uh, assessing how well a company is run we're going to be interested in, in, in their debt ratio so now debt isn't a bad thing in the beginning as a company you're going to want to take on just some debt because you need to invest, and here's a hint for the simulation, you know, in the production page is a thing called operational investments. And you want to invest in those because they help make your company more efficient and lower your future costs of production. So that's why they can build a, a Toyota Corolla today for, uh, for less money than when the inflation adjusted from when they, built, they first built them in 1977. Even though, and if you compare the two cars, you're getting a much more advanced car with tons of new features, better mileage, better engine, better tires, better interior, uh, airbags, radio, uh, not a radio. Um, yeah, like a, um, a full speaker system. You know, you don't know what I used to deal with. Old, ever see an old car? And the, it was basically two small speakers in the dashboard. And now you have this whole multi speaker system and you know mp3 connectability bluetooth rear view camera so how were they able to make such a incredibly uh more advanced car for the same amount of money it's all those investments in robotics and software and um efficiency um training you know research to be able to give you a better car at at the same cost to them and that's sort of the competition, is in technology, the competition. Think about phones. When you buy your next, why do you buy the next iPhone when you already have an iPhone? Why did you get this new iPhone 5? Is this 5S? Just a 5? Well, next year they're coming out with the 6. Do you feel like you should have that? I feel like you should have that. I'll get that for you. You know, because the 6 is going to be a bigger screen. It's going to be more resistant to, to breakage uh, and damage. They have new sapphire glass. It's going to be a new, uh, you know, um, a lot of new key features. But all along, they're trying to, um, Apple is trying to build these new phones at a cost that's similar to when they first came out with the iPhone. So new iPhone 6 is going to be, do you remember the original iPhone? Were you too young? Were you not born yet? 
if you if you look at the original iPhone compared to today's iPhone or new the new iPhone 6, it's going to be vastly superior. But yet a similar price to what they paid to build the first iPhone. And you do that through investment in the company. So that's why it's okay to take on some debt if you're trying to build up your investments or your company. But there's a point where you have to balance it. You can't get into too much debt. Just in, like in your life, right? You can't be the one that keeps buying rounds of drinks for everybody at the bar. Raise your hand if you're over 21. Oh, okay, so these references are not so off. Most people here are over 21. It's not a freshman class. Uh, and Right, so you take turns. Or maybe a better example is you can't be the one, you know, is anybody here uh, in a romantic relationship, a special relationship? Okay, you can't be the one buying dinner every time. That wouldn't be fair. Look at all the debt you would take on if you had to buy every time you went out to dinner. The, um... So you need to have a balance. You can't put all, you can't put everything on your credit card. Sometimes you just have to say no because if you get to a point where you have too much debt, you can't service it. You can't make the uh, monthly payments. So companies have to be careful of this too. So the debt ratio, we look at the relationship between debt to assets to tell us what percentage of the assets are financed by debt. So in your life, if you have assets, phones, cars, computers, and I don't know how so many students are able to afford these, these Apple, what, what's that computer called? That's the Air. And there's another one too that's sort of that size. The MacBook or? Yeah, these are like, that's the MacBook, right? These are after taxes and everything said and done. These are like $2,000 computers. $1,200? Oh, that's not so bad. This was 200 You get what you pay for. Um, I'd like one of those, but I'm saving up. I didn't want to be in too much debt. Oh, you know what I got? I went to Target and they had the new iPad mini, iPad mini Retina display. And if you bought it, the same price is never discounted. Same price everywhere, right? But they gave me a $50 Target card. They had that promotion back. So I have the new iPad mini, yay. It's really awesome. I it was really hard to even come to school today. I just want to lay in bed and just play with it. There's like a whole world on that. Um, you may be listening to this recording on your iPad mini from home rather than being here on President's Day. And this recording is really just for you guys. It's, I'm just putting it up for you. There's no real, like, I can't really reuse it for anybody else. But some of the, on my, on my YouTube channel, there's one recording I made for a class and I have like um, 14,000 views on it. It went viral. And it's just me talking over PowerPoint slides. Like who watches that? I don't get it, but I'm becoming sort of a YouTube sensation, just to let you know. Now, get, a, get on board now and, you know, like and subscribe and be one of the first. But <laughs> What? No, I wouldn't do that because that would be – that. The, I'm not trying to do this to make money. I'm just trying to, you know, have it recorded so people who, who aren't here – if you or some people have uh, second language issues and it's easier to listen to it a second time or – I don't know. Trying to really do it for you guys, not to make money off of it. You know. Although some people make a nice living doing that. They have like um two million subscribers and they get a hundred thousand views. I don't know how much they make per view, but there are people living off that. That's something you could if your job doesn't work out after graduation, maybe you could become a YouTube star. There is no secret. You just you sign up to your YouTube account through uh, Stony Brook Gmail through Stony Brook. You have a YouTube account with that. You just log in, and then you record something, you post it, and then see what happens. That's all. Um, okay. So there are apparently an audience for people who want to hear this. They want to hear me talk about <laughs> finance. Uh, okay, so uh, there you go. Total debt divided by total assets, and this company has 33% of their assets financed through debt. So if you go and buy a bunch of assets in the Zoom simulation, new plants and new, um, 
you know, operational investments and you finance them buying long-term, short-term debt, your debt ratio percentage will increase. This is one of the few ratios where when this increases, your points are negative. They go down. So you don't want to increase this too much. But it's okay to take on some debt like you're doing now to get an education, make an investment, and you get paid back later. So the investments you make in the first three rounds will pay off handsomely in the last three rounds. Uh, but you may suffer some loss of points as your debt ratio increases. Now, debt to equity is looking about um, the ratio between total debt and common equity. So your assets are made up of a combination of both of these. Your asset is made up of debt and equity. So say you own a vehicle, a car, and you have a loan on a car. The car is worth $10,000. You have a loan for $6,000. What's, um, what's your percentage of debt to equity? So you have... 6,000 divided by 4,000. 4,000 would be your equity. Debt would be 6,000. So that would be 1.25, 1.5, something like that. You do the math. Uh, now, if you started to pay off your car and your debt was 2,000 compared to 8,000 of equity, your debt to equity percentage would be 20% or lower. So the lower this number, the better. The less, um, the more, more your company's financed through equity and not debt. And the reason debt is bad, too much of it is bad, is because it consumes profits in the form of interest payments, where equity doesn't. Just like if you live in a house and you pay off your house, you no longer have to pay interest to the bank. So it's cheaper to live there. Wouldn't that be awesome to own your own house and there's no mortgage on it, you paid it off? And you just pay. But what do you have to pay after that, though, if you don't have a mortgage? Taxes and utilities. It's a lot of money. The average, average in a, if you drew a, a line, like a 10-mile radius around campus, the average tax uh, per house is like $10,000 a year. That's just taxes straight up to, to, the, to the, um, uh, the county or the township. That, that's it. It's just gone. Uh, I don't really care about your taxes, Professor Nugent. Can you continue with the lecture? Okay. Um, so this company has a 48%. Let's look at some more debt ratio. Time interest to earned ratio. Operating income compared to interest expense. And this is looking at how solvent a company is, your ability to repay the interest expenses. So let's look at, let's talk about this in more personal view, okay? Um, if you have a credit card and you charge a lot of, of products on your credit card and you say you owe $500 a month in interest and you make $5,000 a month in income. So you have a factor of 10. You have, you're making 10 times what your interest is. So you're pretty solvent. There's really no worry of you not being able to pay your credit card interest. Now, say you graduate, say you complete your, your undergraduate degree and you have $80,000 in loans, but then you want to go to a graduate degree, and then maybe you want to go to medical school or some such thing, and you wind up total loans is $200,000 in student loans by the time you complete your education. That would probably, that could be like $2,000 a month in interest you'd have to pay. You know, because the interest on student loans is the highest. It's like 7.5% some cases. You know, it's um, after you graduate, they apply the interest on it. And it's pretty high compared to mortgages and even car loans. So you better have passed and graduated from medical school because you're going to need that income to pay so you could have enough operating income to pay your interest. Can you imagine how horrible it would be? Imagine this. You get all the way and you fail out of medical school and you have $200,000 in student loans and now no real way to... Uh, what do you do? That's pretty stressful. That's why school is stressful, because if you don't graduate, your whole investment is down the drain. Anybody scared yet? That's why you got to take school seriously, right? Make sure that you, you get a return on this investment. Uh, okay. So this company, the higher this ratio, of course, the better. Let's look at asset activity ratios. Um, how effectively a firm uses its assets to generate sales. So you would want to buy assets. You know, for example, 
a car is generally a liability, not an asset. Because, uh, except if you're delivering pizza. So we have, right, if you deliver pizza, now your car is an asset because it generates revenue. So we like assets that generate revenue. So if you deliver anything or you use your car, to, that even if you use your car to get to work, it's, hopefully you can kind of think of it as generating sales. So if you buy, if a company buys an asset, like a new production facility, a new fa factory for $10 million, like you guys buy, you buy that so you could sell more cars. So you need that so you could build another 800 cars to sell. So that's a good asset because it's generating sales. So in this asset activity, we want to look at how efficient are we with the assets that we're buying. Now, because you don't want to over, um, overspend on assets. You know, for example, there's a reason most subway stores are pretty small in Long Island. You see the subways around here, pretty, usually pretty tiny in the shopping center because there's so much competition for what we call um, heroes. Sometimes, anybody come from a state where you call them hoagies? Anybody here from Pennsylvania? Go to Wawa and get a hoagie? <laughs> no? Yeah. The, um, anyway, you wouldn't build a huge subway with a drive through that they have in other parts of the country because there's just too much competition. You're just not going to get that much business. So the idea is that you buy the right size asset at the time of the business, and then you buy a, uh, you make you invest in more assets when you have the sales or you can make a bigger store. Just like you wouldn't get a big apartment, why would you get a three bedroom apartment if you don't need it? That would just be a waste of your you know paying extra rent. Or if you were going to buy a house, why would you buy a house much bigger than you actually need? Um, so if we look at average collection period, this is a ratio that's going to look at your accounts receivable compared to your average uh, daily credit sales. So if you take, in, in, in the Zoom simulation, you, in m many of the homework problems, just assume, unless they specifically break it out, assume all your sales are credit sales. So if, so if you take your, your total credit sales for the year and divide by how many days are there in a year? Okay, I was getting scared. I thought you were maybe, there's this article flying around all the uh, reading sites where one in four Americans don't realize that the earth revolves around the sun. Have you read that? You can look it up on the internet, but they say one in four Americans don't realize that the earth revolves around. They think the sun revolves around the earth. I don't know. I, I, I can't believe that, but anyway... 365 days is the point. That if you know that, that's good because a lot of Americans don't know that, according to that survey. So anyway, you take your accounts receivable, divide by your average. You take your your credit sales, divide by 365, and get your average daily credit sales. So if you divide by your receivable, you get your average collection period, which is measured typically in days. Okay. So you see here they took their. Um, sales divided by a 365 so they could get their average daily credit and you divide your 430 by that number and you get a, your their collection is 108 days to correct collect their money which is uh, i would say pretty poor you know it's uh generally you want your money in 30 days and some most companies have an average collection period between 30 and 60 days because people pay late right do you guys ever pay a bill late does anybody ever have to pay cable vision I said, no, that's a bill that if you pay that late, they will uh, cut your cable off, which I learned the hard way. Okay, so inventory turnover ratio, your sales to inventory. And this is, we're looking at what type of base of inventory do you have to have to maintain your sales. And, this, and as we discussed earlier, the smaller the inventory, the better for companies. Because if you can have a small inventory, you don't have to tie up a lot of money in inventory. So if you're, say you're a car dealership, you would ideally like to have 20 cars on your lot rather than 100 cars. Because you have to pay for those in advance. So the more money you tie up in inventory, um, the less efficient your business is because you're using cash to put in inventory. 
just th uh, you want this to be a high multiple, and it's looking at how many times your inventory completely you completely replenish your inventory a year. So let's look at it in a scope that might be easier to understand. Let's talk about uh, a toy store. So think of just a small sort of toy, not a Toys R Us, but a smaller toy store, and they buy enough inventory equal to what they'll sell in a month. So how many times a year will they have to do that? This is an easy question. 12. Excellent. So just think of it like this. Every month, you start the month out, your, in your toy inventory comes in, you put it on the shelf, and by the end of the month, all the toys are sold. And then the, the first day of the next month, you replenish. So you do that 12 times a year, which is actually pretty good. Now, what if that store wanted to just buy all their toys at once in January 1st for the whole year? They would have to buy an additional storage facility to stock all this back stock um, and hold it all until they get to G December 31st and they finally sold everything. So you can see what a hassle that would be, the extra cost of storing it, s damage it, s uh, uh, theft, and it, just the fact that you know a new toy might come out. What if something new comes out in the middle of the year or starts selling more heavily and you run out of it in July? You know, so it becomes more efficient if you have, hold a smaller amount of inventory and that you turn it as often as possible. And sp specifically, if you're in the food business, you don't want to hold a lot of food products that there's a chance of spoilage. I have to tell you guys something embarrassing. I hope you don't judge me for it because you can be somewhat of a judgy crowd sometimes. Um, when I, I used to work at McDonald's, uh, in my defense, I was 16 and uh, probably didn't know any better. But I did learn the fact that McDonald's wastes a huge amount of food. At the time, they had these every five minutes, if, the, if whatever you used to build your burgers and everything and put them in this warmer case, and if they didn't sell within five or ten minutes, you had to throw them out. So all day long, I was cooking. I was the grill master. That's how good I was. I was cooking all those hamburgers and putting them in the, in the case, and then... Five, ten minutes later, I was walking around and throwing them in the garbage pail and then doing it again. So you had to become efficient where you made enough that your spoilage idea was, it was sort of like a game in my head. I wanted to make just enough that I didn't have to throw any food out because I always felt really guilty about that. But you didn't want to get a, into a situation where you run out of food and now people are waiting in the drive through and they're waiting in the dining room. You don't like that, right, when you have to wait? You want, that's, you want that food fast. This is before they use microwaves. Now they just pre-cook everything and just heat it in the microwave and it tastes gross. But... Anybody here else ever worked at McDonald's or a fast food restaurant? Bunch of liars. Nobody in this room has ever worked in a fast food restaurant. Okay. Where's that? Tropical smoothie counts. Um, yeah. I went to a tropical smoothie. I was not impressed. Yeah, I was really not impressed. I'm like, I can make this in 10 minutes in my home in a blender. Just get a bag of frozen, and probably healthier too, you know. Anyway, I don't mean to digress. The uh, So you want to reduce your inventory. So if you could figure out ways to reduce your inventory, and in the, um, and in the simulation you'll see a real consequence. If you overmake your inventory because you don't want to stock out, you may have extra inventory uh, that's unsold that leads you to an unexpected deficit because you were saying you're going to sell everything that you make and you suddenly didn't sell everything you make and all of a sudden your deficit goes from you know, 5 million to negative 10 million. So one way in a simulation to prevent that and not lose 100 points is to keep a big de surplus at the end of the round, 10, 15 million. So that way if you do have unsold vehicles, you don't wind up running into a deficit situation, which investors certainly don't like if you have that. Okay, we have time for one more slide. Uh, asset activity ratios, and we're going to go over fixed asset turnover ratio. So here is sort of a subset. We're just going to look at fixed assets, not total assets. So we're going to take away the current assets and just look at plant and equipment in relationship to sales. And we want to see how effective is the fixed assets at generating sales. So a fixed asset could be your... Um, you open up a new restaurant and you buy a, a, or a, a, a storefront and all the equipment inside the restaurant, those are all the uh, fixed assets. And you want to see how much they generate in sales. So if you, if you expand greatly in one year, you're going to, you could, you know, greatly expand the amount of money you, you've, in, you've 
invested in net fixed assets. So hopefully the sales will catch up to that. So the higher this multiple, the better. And generally what happens for companies to make a significant investment and open up a huge amount of stores or uh, is that through time, sales increase. And one of the big uh, retail ca characteristics that people look at before investing in retail is year over year, same store sales. So they want to see that the store is selling more year over year so that the, the net fixed assets or the fixed asset turnover ratio actually improves because they may have the same amount of stores, but now they're selling even more. And that's that as you build a customer base or as you become more efficient in your, in your uh, stores, you start to increase your sales. That's why now when you walk into a store, every they look at sales in every square inch of that store. So everywhere they could have a sales opportunity, whether it's at the cash register with the candy or, or promotional items or every, every area in that store, they're trying to make you to sell you something because they want to increase and they want to develop programs for you to keep coming back. And one program that a lot of companies develop is an investor loyalty program. You know, for example, I like to fly in Southwest because I earn, that's where most of my points are. So I hate to go on a different airline. So I'll even go on Southwest when it's not so convenient just because I'm trying to build up those points to uh, get a free trip. You know, or if you go to the Seawolves market over here and you get your, your coffee card clipped, how many coffees do you have to buy before you get a free coffee? What was that? 10? I think it's 10. And you know, I have like 16 of those cards all with one or two punches on them. So I tried to bring them all together at once and say, can I have, they didn't go for that. All right, anyway, we will continue this next class, which is Wednesday. And I will uh, see you then.